Welcome back everyone. Um, so we're going to continue on with this compact video series. This is my 1985 compact portable. Uh, this is the original compact portable. This one has had a 10 megabyte hard drive installed um, at some point in its life. I'm guessing early on in its life um, in the form of a, uh, a, a plus systems, I think it's plus systems, um, hard card. Now the original hard card was the 10 megabyte version. <coughs> they later came out with larger versions, I think a 20, a 40, up into the 100 and some odd range, uh, megabyte range. And they were very popular for these older systems, um, especially these, um, <coughs> especially these uh, compact units where the owner desired to keep both floppy drives installed. So this one would have left the factory without without a uh, hard drive. And in order to keep the A and B floppy configuration, the hard card was installed. Alternatively, you could install a standard uh, full height or half height uh, MFM hard drive and controller. But this one is exhibiting a very common problem associated with these hard cards. And we're going to take a look at what that problem is and how it looks on a compact portable. So the problem that we have here is that the drive spins up, but it emits a light buzzing sound uh, during post, and it continues to emit that sound um, out, even well after it fails to boot. So let's see what she does now. It's intermittent. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And you hear that sound? It sounds kind of funky. What's happening here is the actuator is unable to unpark the heads because the entire um, head assembly is stuck in position. Now this is dissimilar from a common phenomenon with older hard drives, especially from this time period called stiction, where the heads stick to the platters and the drive fails to spin up. That is an easily cured and very temporary situation that can be cured by jerking the machine physically sideways. You'll see the hard drive icon is showing up here on screen. This is unique to the plus hard card where there is a small icon. This blinks with the drive's actuation. And it's not blinking, which means that it's stuck. And it's gonna fail out on us. There it goes, controller number zero error. So that's what's happening here. Now, this is a temporary situation that can be resolved by letting the machine warm up for several minutes, half an hour or so, and it will usually boot up. I've already done a drive format scan and reinstalled the OS on this machine successfully, even after it first exhibited these symptoms in my possession. So the drive is healthy, but there is a problem. Now, for those of you familiar with quantum hard drives uh, that are often found in older Macintoshes in the SCSI format, or actually, I think uh, Compaq also used quantums, um, and Connor Peripherals has this problem uh, where the drive's head set will, or the, the, the head actuator will stick. Basically the same thing. And uh, as an ironic twist, uh, the company who makes the Plus Hard Card I believe later became Quantum, or was part of Quantum at some point. So, without further ado, let's crack this thing open and uh, take a look. Okay, step one is we need to break into the behemoth that is the Compact Portable. A machine designed to fit under an airline seat as a carry-on. Yeah. I would love to see what would happen if you tried to board a plane with one of these. <laughs> I think you'd be asked to deplane. All right, so we're gonna gently pry up on these little latches. Gently, easy does it. Let's try that again. It is kind of a pain. <clears throat> I 
and we'll get a good look at, uh, at what lies beneath. So, the, yeah, the, the, the uh, You don't want to break the latches because, you know, they don't really sell parts for these anymore. Well, except for those keyboard parts. I'm trying. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> All right. Inside the compact portable, you'll find a series of two cages here and there. The high voltage cage contains all of your CRT circuitry and all those goodies. Um, okay, so this cage contains our I.O. devices and we're just going to loosen up these screws. We don't need to take them completely out. Just loosen them up. The compact portable is quite serviceable. Um, <clears throat> no special tools needed really. Uh, you can make all CRT alignment adjustments with a simple alignment tool by using these holes. And they're all labeled, so it's pretty cool that uh, they kind of made serviceability a thing with this machine. And I suppose that might have something to do with the fact that computers are still hobby horses in 1985. And then there's this random one over here that requires either a wrench or a nice pair of pliers to loosen. I don't know why they did that. Just in a, few, a few turns. At this point, <clears throat> to be able to lift the entire I.O. cage completely out of position. access to all I.O. cards, including the hard card. So let's take a step back and see what we have here. So this board here is Compaq's original five, um, floppy disk controller. Here's the Compaq uh, video board. And this one here is the AST 6-pack plus. This adds a serial port as well as a parallel port in addition to um, extended memory or expanded basic memory. And over here we have our plus hard card. And we're going to remove one screw to pull out the entire card interface as well as the drive itself. And we're just going to grasp firmly by the frame, lift it out of its socket. It's actually a very challenging card to remove because of its placement within the machine. And the fact that we have an AST 6 plaque plus behind it, we might actually want to take that out first. There we go. This guy got it. Ah, we got it. We got it. We're good. A little bit. There we are. Okay, out she goes. Okay, now I want to show you one thing that's unique about this particular uh, unit. This is a demonstration unit. Um, and what that means, I don't know for sure, but I suspect that this was a production sample. Or it was issued directly to a dealer at a discounted price. Um, and this is how we... Take it apart, I guess. I've actually never had one of these apart. This will be a first for me. But you can see it's connected via ribbon cables to the control board. And uh, I don't know if this is a clone of a Western Digital or a Seagate um, board or something entirely different. But what I do know is that uh, these units were known to be problematic anyway. Uh, even when they were working properly, so to speak, they were known for having all sorts of problems. So, bear in mind, we may never get this thing to work properly again. And, but if I'm going to save this machine, I've got to start somewhere.
So I'm going to start by pulling off this plastic shell that's covering the drive unit. And we'll actually see exactly whose drive is in here. I don't believe PLOS manufactured the drive, but it might have been manufactured to their specs by a third party. I also know that uh, this is a stepper motor drive. This is not a voice coil drive. Some of you may have not seen very many of these, and for good reason. They don't make them anymore. Well, they stopped making them many, 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 many years ago. This would have been, this is a job for a black stick. I don't have one here at the house. Um, so I'm using a, just trying to figure this out here. It's glued on. I'm going to be really careful once we get this off. Um, so this is just covering up our screws. That's pretty much all it's doing right now. But it serves a valuable purpose in the hard card. It's designed so that something can actually contact this card directly and not short out against the drive. Pretty slick, huh? Okay, so we got the we got that all apart. Now here is a, a standard three and a half inch drive for comparison. Same thickness, but this one's a little bit longer, and it doesn't really have the same mounting holes. Actually, it doesn't really have any of the standard mounting holes. Um, so it's definitely a unique, a unique unit. Um, so underneath these, I suspect you're going to find additional screws, possibly a security screw. Uh, this is a vent right here. I don't believe there is anything underneath it. Um, and like a lot of modern drives will have a, a nut or something here that goes straight over the spindle. So what we're going to do now is dig up my screwdriver set, which I have over here. We don't want to be using any magnetic screw drivers um, for obvious reasons. If we do, we may end up having to low-level format this sucker, which I do not want to do. So let's see what's under here. It's okay if we break any seals because nicely enough that cover goes right over everything. Yeah, I think there's a screw here. Nope, that's an air hole. And this one probably the same deal. Now over here we have the little air filter. I don't believe there's anything there either. Let's pull it up a little bit. Nope, that's just an air filter. That can stay where it is. Okay. All right, let me get a non magnetic Phillips. Now, actually, these are JIS. Let me grab a JIS screwdriver. A JIS screw is one that has a tiny little dot here or here. So let me go grab one of those. Okay, so I have some JIS screwdrivers and a screwdriver demagnetizer. So this is pretty cool how this works. So if I put it on magnetize, watch what happens. I'm gonna pick up a piece of metal like this battery or this screwdriver right here. Or this paper clip. Let's get something that's pretty lightweight here. So you can see and it picks up this paper clip. Now if I put it on demagnetize, just slide the screwdriver through, it neutralizes the magnetic charge, and it no longer has any attraction to the paper clip. So anytime I work on a screwdriver, oop, demagnetize, anytime I work on a um, on something like this hard drive, I want to make sure that all of my tools that I'm going to be working on are fully demagnetized and I can remagnetize them later on. Okay, so here we go. The room is uh, not the most desirable area to um, work on something like a hard drive, but well, that's what I got. I'm gonna crack each screw a little bit at a time. 
Now, this is important on a lot of the um, drives that are made of cast materials because you can actually warp the drive um, if you torque it or take it apart in the wrong sequence. Um, some of them are very prone to warpage, which will throw everything out of alignment. Now, one of the things I want to mention, now uh, this unique, wow, these screws are magnetized. Um, that's unique to these uh, stepper motor drives is alignment. The alignment of everything in this drive is deathly crucial if you ever intend to read the data that's on it. Um, it is super critical because the stepper motors are not infinitely variable uh, like the um, voice coil uh, drives are. Let me rephrase that. Um, the voice coil drives can kind of hunt and find tracks with greater precision. The stepper motor drives, not so much. So we're going to gently pry the gasket. There's probably a better way to do this, but I honestly don't have high hopes here. I think I'm going to kill this drive in the process of making this video. My prediction is that this drive will never work again. But that's okay, because it doesn't work right now, none does it. <laughs> um, and they all suffer from the same defect. It's not really a defect, as it is just the general aging of the materials. Kind of the same reason why our keyboard uh, had to be rebuilt. Because the materials that were, made, that were used back then for those foam contacts, it has kind of a shelf life. And the problem with this hard drive is simply the fact that the rubber bushings that they used in them have a shelf life. And they go bad and they melt. So let's get, crack this baby open. Being careful not to tear the delicate cables within. And there we are. So this drive has a unique, oh, I've never seen this before. There is a, um, a plastic shroud on top, and our 10 megabyte platter is located just below that. And we have a positioning um, sensor, a little, see that little glass thing right there? Right here. That is so that it can tell the controller what position the head is in. That's kind of neat. This is our actuator motor. Uh, does it have one? I see a bearing for I see a voice coil actuator in there too. Oh, that's different. So this actually is a voice coil motor. I'm sorry. This is not a stepper. It has a voice coil. And this plastic thing here, I can touch that because it's not a platter. I've never seen one like that before. Um, this is designed to create, or to help with the um, Bernoulli effect to allow the heads to float. That's different. And, oh, there's our little bumper. I see the bumper. Okay. And what's happening here is that bumper is causing the head to stick. Now, this is going to be a bit of a challenge to repair for a couple of reasons. Um, so I'm going to show you what happens to these little bumpers. So we're going to use this screwdriver here. It is magnetic. Let's make it not so. Let's demagnetize it real quick. Okay. And let's see what happens. Still magnetic. There may be a magnet buried in the handle. Let's try some other tool. I wonder if the screws are magnetic. Anyway, I'll use a pencil. Okay, so right here is that little rubber bushing, and look at this, the pencil sticks to it. The pencil's stuck to it right now. And that is why the drive doesn't work. What do we do about it, folks? What do we do about it? Well, the general consensus is you've got to remove it. And the only way to do that 
is to remove that. We get that out of there. Let's We're gonna kill this drive, so you might as well do it in style. Yeah, this isn't gonna work. Um, all right. I'll see, uh, Plug this. Okay. And I'm just going to want to come out with all that too. I need to remove. I need to remove this chip here. The reason these magnets don't affect this platter is because of their orientation. It's basically. They cancel each other out, I believe that's how that works. All right, so this all has to come out. I like how there's a plastic shield over the platter. That, that makes my life a little easier. Okay, so I need to do this without causing any harm. I mean you no harm, sir. Honest. Okay. All right. I feel like I'm like I'm living the Goonies and one wrong move and this drive is toast or it's B flat. Okay. These are slightly smaller. These are Hosan JS screwdrivers. Amazing little things. Um, now this is a magnet that we're removing here. Okay. One. Now, I will say that the stakes are pretty low for a drive that's only 10 megabytes in capacity. Why? Because the track density isn't what you'd expect on a modern drive, anywhere near what you'd find on a modern drive. So the margin of error is a little bit greater, um, but these drives were fragile even when they were brand new. So it's kind of a, kind of a, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Now, getting this off, it's held in my magnetic force. Probably just erase the drive there. Oh, and it's taking the entire problem child with it. Look at that. This is our problem child. We gotta get this sucker out of here safely. And we gotta build up a new one with shrink tubing. That's gonna be fun. So I'm gonna get a measurement on its size. I'm gonna use my digital caliper here. And we're going to see how big, roughly, it was. And we're going to try to replicate that. This is one of those Harbor Freight digital calipers. I actually got it from Radio Shack, but it's the same one. And the trick to these is you have to store them without the batteries installed. If you leave the batteries inside, guess what happens? The battery dies. There's a whole thing on why that happens. It's because of the cheap engineering, but as far as a basic measuring tool, they're fantastic. Let's just get a close idea of what the dimensions are on this, because we have to closely replicate that. But, okay. I'm gonna say about eight millimeters without crushing it down too much. About eight millimeters is what we need. So we're going to remove this stuff or try to remove it. And we're gonna use basically paper towels. <coughs> okay. Now is the fun part. We get to rebuild it using shrink tube. So I'm gonna cut some pieces of this stuff down. Nice and straight. Okay. Let's put our first one in position. Well, actually, that may not be so kind to me. There we go. Shove it on there. The uh, the old stuff basically wiped away without any problems. Um, it really didn't put up much of a fight, which was kind of interesting. We want to try to get the landing part where it hits it to about eight millimeters, and that should pretty much get us don't get us going. Um, I had a lighter. Oh, there it is. Let 
you think I should title this video repairing a hard drive with parts from Harbor Freight? Wouldn't that be kind of clickbaity? Okay. All right. Now I'm going to have to trim this down with a razor blade, which means I got to find my razor blades. I never did find them after the move. Okay. What are we at? There are her out. There we go. Looks like we are at five point nine. Get the the remnants of the old stuff off of my calipers. All right, there we go. Let's put one more layer on there. Actually, I think one more should do it. I'm going to have to go up to a slightly thicker or a slightly bigger material. It's going to be this one here. Okay. Trim it down. That should do it. Blaze it up. Blaze it, baby! And I'll have to trim this a little bit. If I get it anywhere close to 8 millimeter, I know I'm okay because it wasn't really a precision measurement anyway. What do we got? 5.8. 5.8, right? Yeah. we can go. One more piece. Trim it down. The real bear is the fact that we have to get it over this lip. Yeah. Really not a big fan of that. I did try this uh, similar repair to this on a Quantum. Uh, I think it was a laptop drive. No, it was a desktop, and it did not work. And I, I gave up. That was um, that was a fail. It was my first one. I figured I'd try it on a drive that was kind of a sacrificial lamb, and uh, didn't work so good for me. Not at all. What we got here? 6.4 millimeters. 6.35. Okay. It's going to take a little bit of more building here. I'm going to trim this material off a little bit and uh, I'll be right back. All right. I got my razor blades. I'm going to trim it about here. This lip of excess material is preventing me from putting more uh, shrink tube in place. So we want to eliminate it. And we're just going to put a cut like that. And it should peel right off. Just like so. Try again. There we go. Almost there. Almost there. Okay. And there's our new bushing, but we need to go a little more. She wants more. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna trim the piece off. And we can we can trim it up a little bit later. Okay.
thickness, please. Seven millimeters. One more layer and we're done. Okay, I think I had one already going here. Yeah, I think one more layer. One more layer should do it. Alright, here we go. That's too thick. Too thin, I mean, it's not the right diameter. It's not going on. About this one. No. Oh, there we go. You know what? Just ram it down, ram it down. Get it on there. Come on, come on. I kind of wonder though if it was originally smaller than that and it had just swollen to that eight millimeter size that we got. You know what I mean? Let's try something a little thicker. Has the same stuff. Yeah. I don't want to go any thicker because the next step I have is way too thick. Way too thick. I say heat it up, but well, <laughs> I think you, you see the flaw in that logic already. If I lick it, get it wet. Maybe it'll slide a little nicer. Put a little butter on it. There we go. And almost there. Let me turn this down, and we'll we'll take the razor blade to it after and and finish finish the install Urgh. okay here we go alright can you do this without cutting himself you might ask probably not Shrink a dink, shrink a dink. All right, zero, good. What do we got? Tell us what you've won. Seven point sixty two millimeters. Seven seventy. I think that's close enough. Like I said, uh, it's a possibility though that the original rubber bushings had in fact swollen, so you've got to take that into consideration. Rubber doesn't usually, well, some rubber shrink, some rubber swell. I mean, it depends on what the formula was, what the conditions were, but I'm going to err on the side of it's probably swollen. So, what I just. Okay. So this aside. Okay. All right, now it's time to get this sucker back together again, huh? What do you think? All right. Now, proper positioning is key. Oh, and we want to scrape off all the stuff from the actuator. But what we want to do is use a Q-tip and some alcohol. Where did I pack those? I think I got them out already. Yeah, there. Because you'll notice that there's a slight 
um, spot where the stuff is um, basically collected. It's basically glue now. It's not rubber anymore, it's glue. Whatever bounces off to it will probably stick to you as well. So we're just going to try to not move the heads too much. Just kind of clean that stuff off. Yuck. These drives were not built to the same level of precision as modern drives. So, you know, it could kind of go either way. It really could. I mean, this could be a failure. It could be a success. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, okay, good. Probably gonna be a failure. But that's just the pessimist in me. Okay, let's get our screws in. If it does work, what I'm gonna do is put the cover, like the actual plastic cover back on. If it doesn't work, I'll just add it to my infinite pile of fail. Sound like a plan? Like I said, there's a really good chance. I mean, look at what we just did there. We had that magnet exposed to the platter at an angle, like, like that's not going to affect anything. Either I have no basic understanding of the fundamentals of magnetism, or I'm just paranoid, or both. Okay, we're gonna connect the encoder. So the encoder is this thing here. That's what tells it what the position is of the head assembly. Because this is not a stepper motor drive like I had originally expected, which is kind of interesting because in 1985, stepper motor drives are still pretty much standard on, well, just about everything. They were, they were cheap and easy to make, I guess, and that's why they were so popular, but um, they were very popular. They're the ones that go, me, 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 you know, they make that weird noise that everybody who, who collects vintage computers loves to hear. That me, 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 sound like, sound like a Muppet. Anyway, that's, uh, so at this point, it, it bumps, it doesn't stick. <sighs> what do you say? What do we say we give it a try? How does this go on? I think it goes on like that. Yeah, that's how it goes on. And that, uh, yeah, leave it on like that. Yep, okay. It just seems a little odd that that cable is folded this way, and well, I'm not so sure if that's right or not. Or if it should go the other way. I think, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, we gotta do that differently. That fold should be down here. Not up there. I'll fix. Here we go. Screw her down. Pop her in. I bet that there was a few people out there that I could have sent this drive to that could fix this problem. But that's not how you learn. That's not how you get better as a technician. Not that there's ever going to be a pressing need for this kind of repair on these drives, but it's one thing I can say, hey, it's, it's better to, for me, it's better to say, I fixed a 30 year old hard drive with parts from Harbor Freight than it is to say, I wrote a check to a guy to fix my hard drive the right way. No one ever, no one ever really, I'm loosen these up. 
Nothing good ever happens when you write a check. <laughs> I mean that figuratively. I mean, nobody writes checks anymore. If you do, my apologies. These probably should be torqued, but I don't have a torque screwdriver. Torque meaning the preset amount of tension on each screw. I'm torquing it the redneck way or the, the farmhand way where you do it by feel. Make sure they're all the same tension. Okay, let's put her in. All right. So, I ended up putting that cover back on. It actually stuck on pretty nicely without any provocation. So let's wipe her down, put her in. Careful, careful, careful. Oh. Missile line. Careful. I'm gonna move some things around. We're gonna put the, um, let's do this. Let's take this out. Okay. And I'm gonna slide the card in to this slot where I have better access. There we go. Look at that. Look at that. Now we're gonna put, our six plus pack card, six pack plus card, way the hell over here. I'm gonna put it right in the middle where it won't bounce around and hit the frame of the machine. All right. And we're gonna fold this. Oh. Okay, yeah, we're gonna fold that over like that. And we're gonna stuff it in here. I'll fix the cabling later. Make it nice and neat. That goes in like that. Look at that. Look at that, huh? What do you think? Am I a genius or what? I'll, I'll sort the cabling out later. Here we go. Ooh, that sounded promising. It's not buzzing. So that means that the heads have actually successfully unparked. How do you like that? That's a good thing. <coughs> and I think the controller readies itself that way, so I'm actually kind of optimistic. Cheers. Okay, here we go. I see activity. I hear activity. Oh my god. No shit. We just fixed a 33 year old hard drive with parts from Harbor Freight. It works, it works, it works, it works, it works. I'm gonna celebrate by racing cars. I forgot this game had sound effects. So there we go. Now let's shut her down. So you hear it automatically parks. It goes bunk. You can hear a it's like bunk little noise it makes when and what that does is it's it's parking the uh, the heads to a safe landing zone. 
Um, so that's clearly, it does have an auto park feature. And in conclusion, I neatened up this cable. I folded it like origami. That's, there was an art form to this at one time. I mean, you, there really was. It was an art form. If you could do nice pleated cables. And I uh, resecured this card um, end piece. I don't, know how that, I don't even know what that's called. Card retainer? Why not? And that's all resecured. And I did put a new battery in this uh, six plus six by six six pack plus card. And uh, I'm not sure if that's really done anything because it's not retaining its memory. But whatever. Um, and we're good. Everything is all happy, and this thing should live another 30 years. Wouldn't that be something? A 60-year-old computer. The thought just makes my mind, my head spin. I mean, really. But here we go. I have heard that these machines are known for bad tantalum capacitors on the logic board. Eh. I'm just hoping mine doesn't get hit by that one. I hear that's a real bitch to fix. And there you go. Yeah, it's, it's good. It really is good. Um, so there we go. <laughs> it's actually the first successful repair in the new office. So I'm going to let this video run a little long. Thank you all for joining. Have a great day.